Our title today is Theistic Evolution Critique, First Life and Digital Evolution. We'll be covering two chapters of the book, Theistic Evolution, A Scientific, Philosophical, and Theological Critique. Um, and um, before we get started, I'm going to point out something that uh, we've pointed out before, but that uh, since somebody may be viewing this as the first time, um, or seeing it as the first time, should probably be pointed out as background information. There is what I would call young life creationism. It comes in several different flavors. Um, there is what is traditionally called old earth. There is actually an old earth young life creationism as well. Um, but old earth traditionally also includes old life creationism. Um, there is what you could call idea theistic evolution, which is, it took a long time, it was very slow, but God helped the process along. Then there is um, what you can call non id theistic evolution. God designed the process so that it would run on its own. Um, so that no intervention was actually needed. Um, or perhaps a small variant of that, the only intervention was done, was done at the level of quantum mechanics and was done in such a subtle way that you can't tell it statistically. The line between ID and non-ID is that intelligent design is not actually that God, that it, that God designed it, but it, or, and, and to be very precise, a designer designed it, but most people figure that the designer is probably God. Uh, but also that you can tell by looking that the designer designed it. Whereas non-ID theistic evolution argues that you can't tell, that it looks for all the world like standard atheistic evolution, which of course is our last option. And that pretty well div uh, divides what, uh, how most people, at least in the Western world, look at things. Um, now, we're not actually, the, the book is not actually critiquing atheistic evolution. It is specifically critiquing non-ID theistic evolution. It takes no position on the first three options. Um, and, in try, and in fact, it's trying to be very neutral, although I think as we get further on, you're going to find out that the arguments are not exactly neutral between those three. But, um, but what we're precisely looking at is the idea that God did it, but you can't tell. That it looks, um, it looks like it's all natural. The chapters we're going to be looking at today are written by James Tour and Winston Ewart. Um, the first chapter is, uh, both of these chapters are in part one, uh, the scientific critique of theistic evolution. Um, and uh, this is uh, section one of part one, which is the failure of neo-Darwinism. And the first chapter that we'll be looking at is called Our Present Proposals on Chemical Evolutionary Mechanisms Accurately Pointing Toward the First Life. And you can see why I abbreviated it to First Life instead of taking that whole title. Um, <coughs> The summary of the chapter, you could think of it as an abstract if you wanted, is abiogenesis is the prebiotic process wherein life such as a cell arises from non-living materials such as simple organic compounds. Long before evolution can even begin, the origin of the first life, that first cell, would have, ha would have to come from some simpler non-living molecules. On Earth, the essence, essential mole molecules for life as we know it are carbohydrates, also called sugars or saccharides, nucleic acids, lipids, and proteins, which are polymers of amino acids. Described, he uses an interesting construction in his uh, thing, sort of vaguely reminiscent of Yoda. Described is the process by which organic synthesis is performed and the considerations that are generally required to synthesize a complex system where many molecular parts come together to operate concertedly. This will be demonstrated in the synthesis of nanomachines, which is, of course, James Tour's specialty. 
then considered will be some proposals that others have espoused for the synthesis of carbohydrates and carbohydrate bearing nucleotide bases, which of course are necessary for RNA from a prebiotic milieu. Briefly mentioned will be the obstacles to the much more difficult task of having the molecular building blocks assemble into a functional system. <coughs> Not considered are scientifically unknown entities that have been proposed to have seeded life on Earth, such as design agent or panspermia. An opinion will be rendered showing that the strongest evidence against the proposals of current prebiotic research is the researcher's own data. The current proposals can retard the field from discovering the scientific solutions since they seem to be directing researchers down paths of futility. That is the uh, summary. The chapter begins, I'm not going to read it all and if you see green dots uh, that means that I've omitted something. Um, any account of the origin of the first life must include a mechanism for the generation of chemicals needed for life and then for how life arose through from those pre-existing non-living chemicals. A biogenesis proposals attempt to explain how chemical processes transformed pre-existing non-living chemicals into more complex information bearing molecules such as DNA, RNA, and proteins. For an account of the origin of life to be realistic, there must be chemical processes that can successfully arrange simple organic compounds into complex, biologically relevant macro macromolecules and living cells. Life requires carbohydrates, nucleic acids, lipids, and proteins. But what is the chemistry behind their origin? What is the origin of metabolism or the information storage and processing systems that depend on these complex biochemical compounds? My experience working in synthetic chemistry, building relatively simple nanomachines, has led me to be skeptical of proposals for the origin of the requisite chemical building blocks necessary for life. Some biologists seem to think that there are well understood prebiotic molecular mechanisms for the synthesis of carbohydrates or proteins, lipids, or nucleic acids. They have been grossly misinformed. Take that. Others think that if not yet known, such chemical pathways will soon be identified. To me, these biologists are naively optimistic. What they hope for will not happen anytime soon. And no wonder, few biologists have ever synthesized a complex molecule ab initio. My experience with organic synthesis leads me to suggest that chemistry acting on its own simply does not do what it would need to do to generate the biologically relevant macromolecules, let alone the complex nanosystems in a living cell. Excuse me. I'd like to explain the reasons for my skepticism in more detail. Designing molecules. Let's begin by discussing the process of molecular design and synthesis. In general, what it takes to successfully build a molecule to perform a particular function. The initial design is important. Sometimes molecular designs are computer assisted, but more often than not, the initial steps are done on paper. A target must first be drawn or otherwise designated. This is no trivial task. In some cases, the chemists have to see, have seen the target in a related system. In other cases, they guess the target's properties on the basis of its molecular weight, its shape, the moieties appended to the main backbone, and its functional capacities. Once a target is selected, retrosynthesis is next, whether on paper or on a computer screen. Placing the target at the top, the chemist draws an inverted tree or graph one step down at a time into multiple branch points until he reaches a level where starting materials are at hand. The inverted tree is then pruned. Certain branches lead to dead ends, they are lopped off. Further refinements of various routes lead to a set of desired paths. These are the routes that can be attempted in the laboratory. Given a target and a path to get there, the synthetic chemist must now try a number of chemical per permutations. Each step may need to be optimized, and each step must be considered with respect to specific reaction site modifications and different reaction rates. What is desired is often ever so slightly different in structure from what is not. If product A is a mirror image of product B, 
one left-handed and the other right-handed, separation becomes a time-consuming and challenging task. One requiring complementary mirror image structures. Many molecules in natural biological systems are homochiral, meaning only left-handed or right-handed molecules are used, but not both. Their mirror images cannot do their work. In addition, few reactions ever afford a 100% yield. Few reactions are free of deleterious byproducts. Purification is essential. If byproducts are left in reaction, they result in complex mixtures that render further reactions impossible to execute correctly. After purification, a number of different spectroscopic and spectrometric methods must be used, uh, forget that quote, got in by accident, must be used to confirm the resulting molecular structures. Make the wrong molecule intermediate, the synthetic chemist quickly learns, and all subsequent steps are compromised. Finally, intermediate products are often unstable in air, sunlight, or room light, or in water. Synthetic chemists must work in seconds or minutes to prevent destructive natural processes or chemical reactions from taking over. Building nanovehicles. As an example of what it takes to synthesize organic compounds, consider the synthesis of a molecular machine, a nanovehicle, a simple unimolecular structure that can translate itself across along a surface when supplied with thermal or photonic energy. He's going to make little tiny cars. You're going to see them or at least their structures. Uh, my colleagues and I make these relatively simple machines in the laboratory, and what we've learned about synthesizing nanovehicles has been published in numerous peer-reviewed papers. We set out to design nanotrucks and nanocars that can move across gold surfaces. They consist of three basic molecular mechanical parts, fullerene wheels, a chassis made of fused aromatic rings or oligophenylene ethylene uh, or it's known as OPEs, and alkynyl axles. Um, so you can figure four, one A and one B for trucks and one e, D and one E for cars. And there's figure four, one. And here's uh, the, one of the original designs. Here's another design. Here's another design. You'll notice there's the alkynyl axles that allows the wheels to actually turn. Um, and uh, here's another uh, little bit of one, and there's, uh, there's a final structure that they found better. And here's one that's even easier to build. It looks funny, but hey, it runs. Um, ours was the first molecular-sized machine that incorporated mechanical components, such as wheels and axles, with movements at the singular, single molecular level. The rolling motion of these nanocars resemble the rolling motion of macroscopic cars. Now before we go on, I want to point out one other thing. See these little things here? Most of these are C10H21. That means that they're long um, al alkane uh, side branches. That's so that the car parts can be soluble in the reaction uh, solution. Uh, it's done in, uh, in organic solvents. We build two different kinds of nano vehicles, a rigid structure in nanotrucks 1A and 1B, the precursors along the synthetic route to these compounds, such as 1C, uh, and a semi-rigid structure in nanocars 1D and 1E. All these designs were necessary because we discovered as we went along that better flexibility of the chassis structure combined with increased number of alkyl units, dramatically increased the solubility of the fullerene wheeled structures in the organic solvents in which they were synthesized. The process was not straightforward. First, we had to work out a way to attach fullerene wheels, 60 carbon sphere, to the alkynyl axles, then a way to build a chassis of the appropriate structure and attach the, the axles to the chassis. New reactions under new conditions had to be worked out in each case. For the nano trucks, the first and second structures proved unworkable due to the stiffness of the chassis and insolubility. We then modified the chassis design. A semi-rigid Z-shaped chassis for nanocars remedied the difficulties. 
The first nanocar structure was still too insoluble to properly purify, but nanocar 1E, the fourth overall design, finally could be adequately purified and characterized. That is, its molecular structure could be determined for f further study. Notice that all this design and experimentation required considerable knowledge and skill, yet even with all these efforts, the properties of each design could not be predicted a priori, and as problems were encouraged, things had to be restarted and redesigned repeatedly. They started out wanting one, they got five, as the only one that they could get to work. In addition, many reagents were purchased to use in this protocol, which of course would have been purified, had to be purified otherwise by themselves. Pretreatment of solvents was needed so that the system would not be contaminated by impurities such as oxygen. Then there was purification, I'm omitting a bunch of stuff. Nature would not have had this luxury as it moved toward the molecules needed for the first life or that first living cell. With Nanocar 1E, we had been able to demonstrate the action of fullerene wheel architecture at the single molecular level using a tunneling microscope. The, uh, the work that I've just described is merely a brief sketch of the processes we went through to synthesize the nanocars. The details are far richer. Obviously, he's not covering everything, and I'm not covering everything that he's covered. Um, so here's something to consider as we think about the problem of the origin of life. The molecular machines and the information processing system that cells use to synthesize macromolecules are far more complicated than anything illustrated here. Designing nanocars is child's play in comparison to the complex molecular machinery and information processing systems at work in the synthesis of proteins, enzymes, DNA, RNA and polysaccharides, let alone their assembly into complex functional macroscopic systems. A point that has become increasingly apparent to me as we've learned more about how difficult it is to build and improve our relatively simple nanocars. The plan to synthesize the fast nanocar, figure 4.3F, involved a, and we'll get to 4.3 in a little bit, involved a molecular, uh, modular approach in which the coupling of the axles and the stator represented the last step. In the following indented paragraph, I present the description of the motor synthesis in its more technical form so as to highlight the many steps and specialized conditions. And if you're reading this and your eyes glaze over, that's okay. For most of you, that's what he actually wants. Here's the, here's the uh, drawing of um, uh, 4.3F right down here. And you can see there's actually two different kinds of cars you can get. And you'll notice the wheels are different now. And we're going to cover that. And the idea is light hits this little side flipper, and it flips it over and powers the car. According to scheme one, shown below, heating, uh, which we'll see I think also, heating ketone one to reflux in an ethanol and hydrazine solution produced the rotor hydrozone two. The conversion of ketone three into thion four was improved by decreasing both the concentration and the reaction time from those in the published procedure. So they had to do some modification there. The generation of the sterically hindered double bond between the rotor and the stator utilized Barton-Kellogg coupling. Don't worry about that if you're not an organic chemist. Hydrozone 2 was oxidized to the unstable diazo intermediate 5 using manganese dioxide by careful temperature control. The inorganic residue was removed by filtration in a setup that enforced the strict exclusion of air, oxygen, and moisture. Get water in it, you ruin it. Theone 4 was added to the deep purple filtrate. A 2 plus 3 cycle addition occurred, and evolution of nitrogen gas indicated the formation of episulfide 6. The white solid episulfide 6 was then treated with trimethylphosphite. Never heard of that stuff before. It's pretty wild stuff. In a screw cap tube at 130 degrees centigrade, over the temperature, boiling temperature of water, to real, uh, yield the molecular motor 7 is a mixture of isomers. Isomers are chemical structures that have the same order and attachment of atoms, but different three-dimensional structures. Or, those of you who are non-chemists. Um, and there's the figure that goes with that paragraph. And you can see a ketone, and you turn, put hydrazine in it, and the hydrogen attaches to it. And uh, 
Here you take an oxygen and you s replace it with a sulfur with a P4S10, nasty stuff. And then uh, here you transform this nitrogen thing here to an azide. And then uh, you can boil um, nitrogen gas off of it and attach it to our bromine sulfur thing. And then uh, eventually you take the sulfur off. So that's what you're looking at. Um, and then, of course, there's more to it than that. And once you get that, you have to attach this alkenol thing where a Y can be either hydrogen or a, a TPS, depending on which m pathway you're going down. And then you have this axle thing that you've already built in another reaction. And you attach, this X could be either iodine or uh, it could be uh, an uh, alkyl, alkyl uh, thing. And then you eventually you attach all of this stuff together using the appropriate temperatures uh, and looks like palladium catalyst for both of those. Um, it's a technical involved pro process. Notice all the places where the chemist was actively involved in carefully controlling reaction conditions. Scheme one above illustrates the compounds and steps involved. We attempted the final assembly of the fast nanocar, scheme two, but the but coupling between TMSA and motor seven did not afford the bi uh, the desired biscoupled product. A more reactive catalyst was used, but the result was disappointing because of a high degree of disc decomposition. By changing reaction uh, reagents and s solvents again, a TIPS protected bisacetylene motor eight was produced. The yield was excellent. Motor eight had its tips group removed producing dialkane 9 in quantitative yield, dialkane 9, and previously synthesized axle 10 were then coupled to produce the fast nanocar in moderate yield. Next, we tried a more convergent synthetic pathway using coupling between motor 7 and alkynylated axle 11 and applying conditions analogous to those for the synthesis of motor 8. The fast nanocar was thus obtained, but in lower all overall yield than obtained from Route 1. So you could go two different ways. One of them is more efficient than the other. This underscores a common occurrence in organic synthesis. Even with modular approaches, small changes in the structure of the reactants make for enormous differences in reactivity. There is no simple workaround. Now remember, this is intelligently designed chemistry. Slow to fast, consider the difference between motorized slow and fast nanocars in figure 4.3. A small change in the rotors had an enormous impact on the rate of their unidirectional rotation. 1.8 revolutions per hour for the slow nanocar and 3 million revolutions per second for the fast nanocar. The rotor portions in the slow nanocar has a six membered ring bearing a sulfur atom and the fast m motor nanocar has a five-membered ring bearing all carbons. And uh, here's uh, his illustration of the difference. You can see that you still have this naphthalene in both cases, but on, on this one, there's a sulfur that's just kind of stuck in the middle of the ring, and on this one, the sulfur is gone. Now, we could have left ketone 12, that's the one with sulfur, in a flask for millions of years and it would not form ketone 1, the one without sulfur, by any known or rational thermal, reductive, photochemical, or enzymatic method. This is not unusual when related compounds have clearly different starting points in organic uh, chemistry. In fact, it's not just un not unusual, it is typical. Wheel changes. Why do we change the fullerene wheels from nanocars in figure 4.1 to the carburane wheel motor vehicle motorized nanocars in figure 4.3e and 4.3f? Because we had to. There is no way to re achieve motor functionality in motorized nanocars using fullerene wheels. We did not know that until we had already built motorized nanocars with fullerene wheels. We learned that after the fact. To our disappointment, when the motors are photo excited, they immediately transfer their energy to the fullerene wheels so that the motors do not rotate. That is, if you have fullerene wheels instead of carburetor that won't take it. 
I'm going to skip over a little bit here. A key point, parts are not always easily interchangeable without severe and unexpected consequences. When working environments change, drastic changes in molecular structure are often required to retain the system's functions. Here's a summary of the process that led to functional nanocars, including further details about difficulties encountered. And I'm just going to go over that because uh, <laughs> you can imagine all of the difficulties that, that he's describing. And if those of you who um, can't imagine and, and want to read them, I advise you get the book. Uh, most organic chemists would agree that even with extensive planning, 90% of reactions are failures. Substrates and conditions must be repeatedly modified to se secure respectable and usable yields. At each step, a massive amount of time is spent on separations and optimizations. If byproducts are permitted to accumulate, they can consume the new steps reagents and alter the course of the reaction. After every one or two steps, there must be purification. If all our reactions were near 100% yield, it would ease the separation problems, but this can take years to achieve if it is possible at all. Most of the time it's 40, 50% yield or, or worse. The loss of materials is expensive. In most cases, these byproducts cannot be converted back to usable compounds in an efficient way. They just period have to be purified out and thrown away. In, unlike what would have been present in prebiotic times, we have plenty of resources available. We use petrochemicals as our major feedstocks, and these come in enormous amounts from fine chemicals producers. Large amounts of energy come from power grids. Solvents need to be pre-distilled before use, since small impurities can promote or catalyze undesired side reactions. Intermediate molecules need to be pre-made and not properly stored in a freezer away from light and oxygen to prevent their decomposition while uh, the other segment of the synthesis are being done. Imagine that doing that blindly by nature. A rich chemical literature provides guidance. Although modifications are almost always needed, none of this would have been possible on the prebiotic earth. As a further difficulty, reagent addition order is critical. A needs to be added before B and then C and each at its own specific temperature to affect a proper reaction and coupling yield. The parameters of temperature, pressure, solvent, light, pH, oxygen, moisture have to be carefully controlled. It's not cheap. Water is the great solvent, but organic synthesis is very hard to do in water. Highly oxygenated compounds are needed. By doing our nanocar organic synthesis in organic solvents rather than in water, we markedly lessen the difficulty. It is a luxury that nature did not and does not enjoy. Starting from scratch, she would have had to design and redesign her structures, discarding the inevitable false starts and dead ends as they occurred. Any prebiotic system is destined at least some of the time to crash and burn. How would nature know where to stop or how to start over with a no goal in mind? Now these are just the general things that he's observing. But whatever else she may have been doing in the prebiotic era, era, nature was not consulting the modern chemical literature. Life lessons for the prebiotic chemist. To illustrate that the problems I describe above are not limited to exotic structures such as nanocars, let's examine the system of foundational organic molecules, carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are the backbone of nucleotides, which in turn make up DNA and RNA. In other words, they are necessary for the RNA world. Um, carbohydrates also serve as recognition sites for cells to communicate with each other and as food sources for living systems. The difficulties involved in carrying out carbohydrate synthesis in a prebiotic environment parallel those found in making nanocars. And he's going to illustrate by the chemical literature. Consider the pentose structures, su sugars, carbohydrates with five carbon atoms, which we'll show you in just a minute. These sugars have three stereogenic centers so that there are eight possible isomers. Some substructures are enantiomers, or mirror images, others diastereomers, not mirror images, all are chiral, handed. When we carry out chemical reactions, we design the reactions to minimize diastereomeric uh, mixtures that can be nearly impossible to separate. 
And here's the complete set of sugars. Um, if uh, the easy way to visualize this is to think of the the uh, CHO group going down, the CH two OH going down, and all of the H's and OH's sticking up, and that'll give you a good picture of of uh, and you'll notice these two are mirror images of each other. These two are also mirror images of each other. These two are mirror images of each other. And these two are mirror images of each other. But none of these are exactly the same as the other one because of the precise arrangement. And in fact, ribose will have two hydroxyl groups when it forms a ring uh, sticking down and the CHO group sticking, or pardon me, the CH2OH group sticking up. Um, that is for D-ribose, which is this one. And that's the one that's normally used in RNA. All of the rest of those don't work. So how difficult would the synthesis of D-ribose be under prebiotic conditions? Again, this is necessary for the RNA world. Albert Eschenmoser is a great synthetic chemist. He spent years suggesting prebiotic routes to the five carbon pentoses. Direct synthesis of ribose, he discovered, was not successful when starting with glycoaldehyde. And this was the original first proposal. You just keep adding formaldehyde. Actually, you add formaldehyde to itself to produce glycoaldehyde, and then, the, uh, uh, then you keep adding it and adding it and adding it. And what he discovered is that if you use an old-fashioned foremost reaction, in which a base is catalyzed with formaldehyde in the presence of a divalent cation, cation such as calcium. If you do that, um, you don't get the right stuff. We did our best to, we try our best to avoid the undes undesired diastereomers because their separation is too time consuming and expensive. They waste a huge amount of starting material. They generate unwanted products. And antiomeric separations are all the more difficult. Nature has apparently chosen a har far harder route using predominantly one enantiomer, uh, homochiral, D ribose in a system with multiple stereogenic centers. So it can go any one of eight ways. It has to be that specific one. To synthesize ribose, Eschenmoser had to make phosphorylated glycoaldehyde, glycoaldehyde phosphate, which I'll show you in just a minute. Since glycoaldehyde is the dimeric form of formaldehyde, he first had to make the dimer of formaldehyde. Only then could there be further aldol chemistry in the foremost reaction. A good organic chemist can design conditions that will isolate the product, purify it, and then proceed. A very good organic chemist, this is what Eschenmoser did. So first thing he has to add formaldehyde to itself to give you glycoaldehyde. So he adds two of these, uh, one to the next one, and you get uh, something like that. And then you have to phosphorylate it at the end, which requires a different reaction. And then you have to start adding more formaldehyde. Skipping over a bunch of uh, lists uh, there. In other words, the formaldehyde started life in a strong base. Its product was isolated and freed from the strong base and exposed to a neutral aqueous solution of amidotriphosphate, uh, which the researcher made separately. That product, glycoaldehyde phosphate, was then isolated and conveniently re-exposed to a strong base to add the rest of the formaldehyde. Even with this masterful design, the result was mostly undesired racemic hexose triphosphates. That is, you got glucose and things like that, which are longer than ribose. Eschenmoser placed the glycoaldehyde phosphate in the strong base and then added 0.04 moles per liter of formaldehyde to obtain a 40 to 50 percent yield of mostly racemic pentose diphosphates. Pen the pentoses are that whole set that you saw. So 40 to 50 percent of mixed stuff. Okay. Even Eschenmoser did not attempt to separate out the desired, albeit still racemic, ribose 2,4-diphosphate. Somewhere along the line, it picked up another phosphate. And for very good reason. It would have been nearly impossible. 
And remember, we're trying to make ribose. As chemists, not just letting it set out and let nature do it. Biologists can easily imagine nature selecting the correct isomer because they work in a world that enjoys the specificity of biological systems. By the way, these are his italics. Not so synthetic chemists who are bound to prebiotic molecules. Selected by what? No enzymes were yet available. The data more readily suggests that no prebiotic process is likely to yield the requisite carbohydrates, at least in the concentration needed and the purity needed. The most masterful of synthetic chemists could produce only gross mixtures. How is nature supposed to do this herself? Also, time works against life. Over a mere 23 weeks, the desired diastereomer, the racemic ribose 24 diphosphates was reduced from a 17% yield to a 7% yield. After a year, there would be very little left. In the laboratories anywhere else, it is essential to stop a reaction before the desired product degrades. Nature got her stopwatch out, I guess. Going on for, there's several more paragraphs of the same kind of thing. Um, again, uh, if, if you want more detail, I strongly recommend reading the uh, chapter itself. Wish fulfillment from a page, paper on prebiotic chemistry. Moreover, there was the well-known but still no less remarkable fact that in cellular biochemical processes, monosaccharides apparently never operated in a free, free state, but always in phosphorylated form. It is a short step, this is, he's quoting the paper, short step from such consideration to the notion of a primordial scenario in which, again, phosphorylated and not simply neutral forms of carbohydrate would have been operative. Just, um, you know, it's easy. In a self-organizational process, in a primordial environment, it may have been of primary importance for carbohydrate molecules to escape chemical chaos, finding themselves instead a concentration suitable for chemical reactions. Yeah, I guess so. And in reaction spaces that would facilitate efficient chemical transformation. With respect to both requirements, phosphorylated sugar molecules would, through their electrical charges, have offered advantages over neutral water-soluble carbohydrates in environments containing mineral surfaces or minerals with expandable layer structures. So I guess the phosphate enables them to stick to clay or something. That short step, this is Tour's comment now, is not short at all. Biochemical routes are far downstream and occur in far more complex scenarios. In the laboratory, phosphorylation requires precise control of phosphorylating agents. These hopeful, again, this is Tour's uh, italics, but unlikely suggestions pain the synthetic chemist under any circumstance, but for some remarkable reason, they are tolerated in prebiotic chemistry. <laughs> Skipping over six more paragraphs of the same kind of thing, it stands to reason there must have been a chemical means once upon a time to generate an information-bearing molecule such as DNA or RNA. Since the 1960s, a number of biologists have suggested that the polymer is RNA rather than DNA, such as the RNA world hypothesis. And chemically activated ribonucleotides can, can polymerase to form RNA. So far, so good. But RNA is far less stable than DNA, and whatever the polymerization, it yields generic RNA, uh, random uh, collections, a molecule lacking sequence specificity. Had RNA researchers succeeded in producing a volume of random sentences, for example, subtens, flac, lacrimose, assurient, if you can't make sense of that, that's the point, none of them would have imagined that they had succeeded in composing King Lear. <laughs> the coupling of a ribose with a nucleotide is the first step, and even those engrossed in periodic research have difficulty envisioning that process, especially for purines and pyrimidines. And he notes John Sutherland and his co-workers and says the conditions they used were cleverly selected. And I'll skip over the clever selection here. It remains clear that the controlled conditions required to generate even a mixed set of select structures is painfully improbable. Skipping over abiogenesis research, and again, these are Tours italics. 
would never be accepted in any other area of chemistry. And that's the truth. Extrapolation on steroids, but this is not the end. Making carbohydrates, lipids, amino acids, and nucleic acids still has not built a cell. To imagine the abiotic assembly of such an overall cellular system or subsystem, however, places great demands on hypothetical prebiotic chemistry, the, one of the understatements of the century. Yet this revealing comment by Sutherland and his co-workers is coupled with their disclosure of a new experimental finding showing, to quote them, that precursors of ribonucleotides, amino acids, and lipids can all be derived by the reductive homologation of hydrogen cyanide and some of its derivatives. Hydrogen cyanide is, is one of the bases for, yes, yes. Uh-huh. The key reaction steps are driven by ultraviolet light, use hydrogen sulfide, you know what that does to people, as the reductant, and can be accelerated by a copper one, copper two, photoreduct cycling. Wow. As he says, dream on. The world's best synthetic chemists, biochemists, and evolutionary biologists have combined forces to form a team. A dream team in two quite distinct senses of the word. Money is no object. They have at their disposal the most advanced of the analytical facilities, the complete scientific literature, synthetic and natural coupling agents, and all the reagents their hearts might desire. Carbohydrates, lipids, amino acids, and nucleic acids are stored in their laboratories in a state of 100% enantiomeric purity, which means L-amino acids, it means D-sugars, etc. Or you want to do it reverse, it's fine. Um, would the dream team please assemble a living system? Take your time, folks. Take a few billion years. Nothing? Well, well, well. Let us assume that all the building blocks of life, and not just their precursors, have been made to a high degree of purity, including homochirality, where applicable, the carbohydrates, amino acids, the nucleic acids, and the lipids. They are stored in cool caves away from sunlight and away from oxygen. These molecules are indifferent to environmental degradation. And, you know, you're not going to get anything. We teach our students that when a mechanism does not support their observations, the mechanism must either be revised to support the facts or entirely discounted. They are not required to provide an alternative. Those who think scientists understand how prebiotic chemical mechanisms produce the first life are wholly misinformed. Nobody understands how this happens. Maybe one day we will but that day is far from today. It would be far more helpful and hopeful to expose students to the massive gaps in our understanding. Then they may find a firmer and possibly a radically different scientific theory. Now, that's the end of Tours chapter, and now we go to uh, uh, Winston Ewart's chapter, which is called Digital Evolution Predictions of Design. I'm gonna read the summary Again, sort of the abstract. Computer simulations of evolution are often invoked in the defense of the abilities of Darwinian evolution. A number of well-known simulations are discussed showing how they follow the prediction of intelligent design in requiring teleological fine-tuning in order to work. This and other predictions of intelligent design have been confirmed by simulations, whereas Darwinian evolution offers no predictions about computer simulation and is thus unfalsifiable. Um, and then there's an introduction with 10 uh, paragraphs, a uh, part two, which is what are computer simulations of evolution? So you get some idea of the background and then his comment that design requires intelligence with supporting material. And then examples of uh, attempted proofs of evolution, Dawkins weasel, 22 paragraphs, EV, Steiner trees, and Avida. And then, finally, he has a conclusion that I'm going to skip over the first eight paragraphs of and just read the last one. Uh, this is the first half of the last one. It's a rather long paragraph. Writing at the blog Pandas Thumb, intelligent design critic Richard B. Hopp wrote, research using computational models of evolution are a thorn in the side of intelligent design proponents. But this is not true. 
Darwinian evolution is unfalsifiable. No computer simulation counterexample could prove it incorrect. As such, it risks nothing and gains nothing from any examples that demonstrate any sort of evolution. In contrast, intelligent design is falsifiable and makes accurate predictions. It forbids the evolution of design without intelligence and makes accurate predictions about the limitations of Darwinian processes. The truth is that computer simulations are a nail in Darwinism's coffin and a powerful demonstration of the predictive power of intelligent design. Again, if you're really interested, I recommend you get the book and read the chapter. Now, my own take on this is that taking you its article first, which is the last one we went over, it's interesting and would be useful if one were ever to need the counter, uh, to counter serious arguments for evolution from computer simulations. But as Ewart notes, there are no serious arguments for evolution from computer simulations. Wherever the simulations work well, they do not imitate nature well. And wherever they imitate nature well, they do not work well. Um, Ewart provides a convenient summary and mostly accurate critique of the various computer programs that are alleged to prov prove the feasibility of evolution. I'll mention why I said mostly in just a minute. I have a small problem with this conclusion. This is it. If Darwinian evolution is unfalsifiable, no computer simulation counterexample can prove it incorrect, and as such it risks nothing and gains nothing from any examples that demonstrate any sort of evolution, then it would seem that computer simulations cannot be a nail in Darwinism's coffin, because if it doesn't prove anything, then it doesn't prove anything. If it doesn't suggest anything, it doesn't suggest anything. But I will have to say that that's probably not Ewart's fault completely. The idea that the lack of falsifiability is fatal in science actually needs modification. We find out that falsifiability cannot be applied directly uh, in that regard. Theories can indeed die with a single set of observations, although it is rare. But more often, they die a death of a thousand cuts. You find out the wrong here, you find out the wrong there, you find out the wrong there, you find out the wrong there. Pretty soon people don't pay any attention to it. Um, phlogiston theory was never actually proven wrong. It just didn't predict anything and make it stick. Lakatos was more accurate than Popper on the basic philosophy of science. Perhaps Eward would agree with me and was just not being completely clear, so I'm not going to totally lay that at his doorstep. But uh, that's a long discussion on the philosophy of science, and I don't want to go into it right now. However, people have tried to make an argument based on the supposed possibility of, a li of life arising from inanimate matter, and um, spent quite, uh, quite some time, and in fact, it's demanded by their theory. So I find that Tour's article has more direct relevance to the question at hand. As Tour noted, the more one looks at the data, the less likely the scenario looks. RNA world is the best scenario, as evolutionary pressures can theoretically arise early in the process, well, relatively early. But Tour outlines in some detail just how hard it is to get ribose. And without ribose, the RNA world is a pipe dream. Then, once you get ribose, you have to attach the bases to ribose and then attach the phosphates, and, or maybe vice versa, uh, in different order, and then get a specially ordered RNA that can catalyze its own re reproduction, and then the RNA world could theoretically happen. Tour reminds me of reading Robert Shapiro in 2007. That's a Scientific American for those who are interested. It's available on the internet, and I forgot to put the, uh, uh, the reference there. The analogy that comes to mind is that of a golfer who, having played a golf ball through an 18-hole course, then assumes that the ball could also play itself around the course in his absence. He has demonstrated the possibility of the event. It was only necessary to presume that some combination of natural forces, perhaps earthquakes, winds, tornadoes, and floods, for example, could produce the same result, given enough time. No physical law need to be broken for a spontaneous RNA formation to happen. But the chances against it are so immense 
that the suggestion implies that the non-living world had an innate desire to generate RNA, or maybe an intelligent designer had an in innate desire. And it is important to note that if there is an intelligent designer for the first life, then we have a non-human, or at least non-earthly human, designer in the universe. And actually smarter than any, any humans, any human or combination of humans that lives today. Either we are talking about a supernatural and superhuman intelligence in which ga the game is up, or we are talking about a natural intelligence from, I don't know, planet Vega or something. Um, <clears throat> which presumably required an intelligent designer also, because we did, and so on. But the problem is you get to 13.7 billion years, in, it, at which time the, uh, maybe it's 14, maybe it's 12, who cares? Um, when the original designer cannot have its intelligence dependent on the arrangement of matter, and must be what would usually be called supernatural. That's why this is, uh, the, uh, this is so important. You get back to something that is basically equivalent to God. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Ariel. Uh, this, this is uh, extremely interesting and uh, a whole new area that uh, I was unfamiliar with. Uh, in terms of the uh, RNA. Uh, he creams it. Uh, that really, uh, but then I, I think at the whole picture, he has just scratched the surface of the total information necessary for the simplest form of life we have. He's, he's, still, he's, still, he's still playing down in the basement uh, when we, we need a, uh, you've got to have all these molecules synthesized at the same time in the, in the same, same place. place in order to get a life started by itself. And it has to be life that has such tremendous information that it can reproduce itself can maintain all these metabolic things. Uh, he didn't get into proteins and the, the chirality problem there and so on. Uh, I mean, uh, he, he touched a little point that I think can be multiplied many times uh, when you look at the total picture of the information theory angle. Oh, I agree. And, and it bypasses all the other stuff. Uh, and then when, next to you whenever you're done. Are you going to comment? <laughs> well, we'll let the biologist speak first and then the biochemist. Um, it, it, was, it was fascinating to me and the students I was working with back when I was teaching in this area <clears throat> that Richard Dawkins in Climbing Mountain Probable uh, way sort of hidden back in about the last 25% of the, of the book says, uh, well, I recognize that the origin of nucleic acids uh, in a way that would start life is impossible because you can't use them without pre-existing enzymes, which are made by nucleic acids. But what I found fascinating, since in Clang Mountain probably was published like 25, 30 years ago, it has not affected his solutions. No. He admits he can't get started, but keeps going anyway. <laughs> well, that's because he needs to keep going. And that's what this, that's what this whole thing shows, is that, I mean, we as creationists are often accused of having our conclusions before our, our uh, uh, our, our premises. And, and in some cases that's true. Uh, but uh, in other cases, by the way, it's not. Many people, including Dean Kenyon, for one, 
have come around to the creationist uh, viewpoint because of the evidence. Um, but the fact of the matter is that what this, what your comments really demonstrate is that Dawkins is doing the exact same thing he's accusing creationists of doing. Of course. He has his conclusions before his premises have even begun to work. Only he does it with even greater assurance. Yes. Uh, another opportunity I've had, um, <coughs> I believe we were celebrating the 50th year of the double helix, Watson and Crick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They called a large group of prebiotic chemists that set her together. And I, had to, I happened to be in Houston at the time, so I went to the meetings. And it was really interesting. Uh, Sostak, who I think after that got the, a Nobel Prize, had his group working on creating very short uh, uh, RNAs. But his model of producing them was setting up a synthesizer and somehow convincing it to, to do random synthesis. And then people would take his mix and see if they could make it go somewhere. Well, it, what it ended up doing was going nowhere I'm not sure how, where, he, where the Nobel Prize entered that whole picture. I have no idea. Well, maybe the Nobel Prize people um, actually have their conclusions made up, too. Well, you're, you're not kidding. Um, <laughs> Look the, how they uh, treated the guy who invented um, uh, MRI. Yeah, well, I've forgotten his name. but video uh, is something. Uh, uh, one very good chemist at... Uh, University of Colorado Boulder got the Nobel Prize at the time he finished his PhD thesis because he provided a welcome suggestion and supposedly resolution involving how RNA could be the answers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But think about this though. The standard theory of the RNA world is that there's actually a whole world where nucleotides are plentiful. Pardon After me. reading that, can you, what we read today, can you even half believe that that could happen? I, I misspoke. His Nobel Prize came for demonstrating for the first time catalytic RNA. Yeah. No, it's your turn. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just mention this because of what we've been discussing here. Uh, each side is accusing the other of starting with an idea and trying to demonstrate it. Uh, I'll uh, tell you about an incident that happened here about 30 years ago, maybe 25 years ago, in, in a sabbatical class. A noted past general conference official got up and stated, he says, the thing that's wrong with the Geoscience Research Institute, of which I was the director at the time, uh, is that they start with their conclusion and they try and bring the science to, to that conclusion. I felt I needed to say something, uh, <clears throat> although I, I realized uh, that there's probably some truth to that to a certain extent. But I, I just got up and made the point uh, that some of us have studied this for quite a while, and we've come to some conclusions. I said, give me the privilege of drawing some conclusions here. If I don't have any conclusions, then of course, you say my mind is open, I can't draw any conclusions, I can't do anything. Uh, if I can't draw some conclusions, uh, my whole life's gonna be a waste in agnosticism, agnosticism and so on. So I, it's, uh, we're accusing, each side is accusing the other of 
of uh, starting with a conclusion and so on, uh, you have to look at the evidence. I and mean, when you look at the evidence you saw today, uh, you're entitled to some conclusions. Otherwise, you're paralyzing your thinking. Well, you see, what he really wanted is not that you don't, uh, that you start with your conclusions. What he really didn't want you to do was to draw any conclusions that differed from uh, ones that he approved of. I should point out, he, he came into my office uh, a week later and apologized for what he had said. Uh, the conversation that followed wasn't all of the fruitful, but it was interesting. Yeah. The, the fact that one has to apologize suggests that, that he was not being as careful as he could be with his original comments. Which, by the way, means that we need to be as careful as we can be with our original comments. Um, my own philosophy on that is very simple. Make your weed words as sweet as possible so that when you eat them, they're easier to get down. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're going to love that. <laughs> well, what, just to summarize briefly, uh, what we've heard today is that producing the basic molecules that are necessary to life, contrary to popular belief, is not trivial, number one. Number two, assembling them into some meaningful, mm, functionally effective organization so that you actually have a living cell is a whole new level of complexity that we have no concept to begin with of how to accomplish. But if we were to give ourselves benefit of doubt and we actually achieved it, we would only achieve the level of protista at that point, which means the level of single-celled life form. To go from a single-celled life form to a eukaryotic, fully developed organism is like programming the pliers to produce an electrician. Do you see how at each stage there is a whole new level of complexity, uh, complexity required and it all has to be solved, worked out and programmed into the system the information must be contained therein yes. to make it possible. Yes, Gavin Newsom won the lottery, California lottery today. Um, Gavin Newsom wins the California lottery next week and the week after that and the week after that. At what point do you stop and say, I think this is a setup? Uh, right behind you. Go ahead. Testing? Okay. I thought that the, uh, the presentation was great. And, of course, I'm a creationist. And uh, it, I, I am convinced. It was easy to convince me because I was already convinced. Uh, <clears throat> uh, his, you know, all of the arguments, oh, they make all, they make sense. But there is a vast gulf between the uh, creationists and the evolutionists. And, you know, uh, you're preaching to the choir here, really. I mean, I would say that, that the evolutionists would not be deterred with these arguments. And, you know, uh, these arguments are very good, and, but probably not necessary for creationists. That's partly true. Um, 
there are there are, are efforts we we do occasionally invite people of a different persuasion uh, we've uh, always even, invited we we even invite people of a different persuasion occasionally to present and that has made for some memorable presentations um, uh, the other thing we're trying to do to extend it beyond this room is uh, we're actually recording this thing, um, in, including comments afterwards. And we hope that people who are uh, out in the middle of Nebraska uh, who don't have any, uh, you know, any creationist colleagues or anybody else to talk to and who are faced with the question of, well, what do you do with the RNA world? We th we've got we've got the uh, evolution of life, including the origin of life, solved. We hope that this kind of thing goes out to them and they have a chance to look at it and be able to use it. Um, in some cases, maybe even be convinced about it. Um, that I, one can argue that we're not doing a great job of marketing, I guess. Um, that will require a marketing specialist, not me, because I'm not one. But uh, uh, we are hoping that this actually does go out and make a little bit of a difference. Um, there are a lot of other things that are going on too that we're trying to uh, make some sense out of. Uh, we're trying to get, because I agree with you. Right now, I don't know, I think we probably convinced everybody here. Um, I don't, maybe, maybe one or two are not totally convinced. Um, but I, uh, I think most of the people here are convinced. Um, but, you know, if there's one or two here, that helps. And if there are other people out there that, that get it on the Internet uh, and some of these things are looked at, it uh, will make a difference. Um, and that's partly why we're doing this, is we're going over things in a systematic way that will be useful not just to the people here, although you know, it looks like there are enough people here that they're at least, you know, some people are finding it useful, mm -hmm. um, but that it will be useful to other people in the future. And you know what, if somebody looks at one of the presentations, is convinced and then starts their own stuff and their stuff is far more popular than ours, that's fine with me too. Because, you know, this isn't a race for personal glory. This is a race to try to get the truth out. Uh, I would say neutrality is uh, attractive. Open mind is attractive, but it's also possible that some groups are closer to the truth than others. And uh, let's keep that possibility in mind. I think so too. Uh, comment here and then Doug. Very brief comment. That is, I see creationism as I understand it to start with a statement, an admission, that we don't claim to understand how things got started. That it required a designer and we end with that point. Uh, that really puts us in a position where demonstrating the validity of that is outside the realm of our our possible approaches using science. Yeah, well, you know, we have to do very much with, let's say, what we do with the resurrection of Jesus. We have no clue as to how that happened. I mean, I can make up some theories, but certainly none that are physically based, shall we say. The real question is not whether we can understand exactly how it happened. The real question is historically, did it happen? And if it did, then we're just going to have to admit our ignorance of how it happened. There, there is one additional point, however, and that is, uh, since I come from the academic world, um, it is more appealing to young people to people who are forming their own approaches to be able to talk about using science to solve the problem. That's a more appealing approach than saying, well, we just have to 
admit there's a creator who did it. And that's, that is an area that can be very disappointing when you're in education. You see a few students going out the door and saying, well, I choose to, uh, to go to the group who says they have some hope of resolving them, resolving it in using techniques that I can understand, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's, that's a great point. The only thing is that when they, shall we say, fuzz the details, and you can see the details are horrendously hairy. Uh, it, when, when people start saying, oh, we've got it figured out, when in fact they don't. That's not really playing fair with science either. Comment here, and then. <clears throat> so um, often, as evolutionists will, um, when when they come up a hard problem, they employ like a uh, tremendous amount of time, uh, planet size, resources. Um, what's that? Yeah, but what, what I'm saying is, you know. The RNA world is a world where RNA is covering the world. <clears throat> And you look at it and you say, on what planet? Right, right. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's what I'm saying here. What, what I'm saying is um, a, a, a prebiotic Earth with the concentrations that they posit, let's say. Um, so if you have quadrillion uh, molecules on Earth times a billion years uh, at um, molecules bumping into each other at hundreds of millions of times per second or I don't know maybe a million times per second or something like that it is what this book is saying it, it does it say even despite all of those potential mm -hmm. chemical interactions in a dilute environment not a you know there's ribose every tenth molecule is ribose on some RNA world uh, but rather on a hypothesized uh, early earth how, how does this book say that all of those potential chemical interactions don't get you to a self-replicating molecule that has enough to work with to keep replicating? Well, what this book says is that getting to that RNA world is unrealistic, completely unrealistic. And so if you can't get to the <laughs> RNA world, then the RNA world can't start evolving ribozymes that catalyze their own replication and that uh, <coughs> start doing metabolic things and the, the kind of stuff that, that are necessary. Um, that's vaporware right now anyway. And I think everybody who's in the field recognizes that. <coughs> we haven't seen any of that. We have seen some simple reactions that are catalyzed and some that can catalyze, let's say, five or ten nucleotides to be attached together in an in, in appropriate fashion. That's not, you know, that's not a, that's not a replicase of the kind that we're used to in <laughs> cells, where it will replicate the entire molecule. So, so even with a billion years times, you know, quintillion interactions within that period of time, that's not enough to get to 10 or 20 where you're really poking into that chemical space? Yeah. Um, you know, the principle is supposed to be that, well, if you can get 10, well, then maybe <coughs> the next 25 will be a lot easier because you just modify that one that does 10 a little bit. But the fact of the matter is we, we haven't seen that yet. And, and the real problem, which is James Tour is pointing out, the real problem with the RNA world is you can't get to it to begin with. I mean, it seems to me as though if, if, you can't, if, you, if the uh, like ribose concentration is low enough because there's not a pathway to that necessary you know, chemical, then any lucky, uh, you know, shall we call it a hopeful monster, um, of a, of a molecule wouldn't be able to it would degrade before before, before it found another partner to to make t a, di a dimer of RNA. Well, I'm not even talking about sex. I'm I'm talking about uh, if if there's no ribose on the planet, if 
there was a lightning, lucky not lightning strike and okay, ribose was created somehow. Um, it doesn't have ribose in the environment to be able to reproduce itself. Right, right. You can't get the raw materials. Right. You know, um, it reminds you of the joke about the uh, physicist, the chemist, and the uh, mathematician that were stranded on a desert island and a can of beans washed up. And so the chemist, uh, the physicist tried heating it over a fire to try to see if he could open the can. And the uh, chemist tried d d dissolving an acid, see if he could get it open. Uh, how you get the acid was a little difficult, you know how much acid and so forth. And uh, so, they, so they asked the mathematician, will you try? And he said, uh, suppose we had a can opener. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the RNA world is really that kind of supposition. Before you can get the can opener to work, you have to have a can opener. And the truth of the matter is the can opener getting it to work is even difficult. Uh, the the uh, biochemist and, and uh, origin of life researcher, uh, Eugene, um, I think it begins with a V, I'm blacking on his name right now. We, we did a Sabbath school on him once. Um, uh, anyway, the Russian guy. Um, uh, wrote a whole article on what the probabilities were. And he said the probabilities of getting, um, of getting just the RNA to do RNA duplicates. Assuming that it took only 100 instead of 180, which is the amount that we're needing to do these uh, binary <coughs> modifications. Uh, the chances of that happening are enough to take the entire uh, the entire work of the RNA world to to go. And if you know, if you're trying to say that that would happen with uh, you know a little bit of ribose here and a little bit of ribose there, a little bit of ribose somewhere else, it's not happening. And if you can't get to the self-replicating enzyme to begin with. It's all over. And that's why I reg regard this chapter as probably the best nail in the coffin of the RNA world. Because what, what Tour points out is that you can't get to the can opener to begin with. <coughs> yes. Uh, following Jack's uh, comment about these young people tending towards science, and I, I don't blame them for doing this. I mean, the, the scientific uh, community is such a powerful uh, community, and it's uh, such a, it produces such wonderful results, and so on. Uh, but I, uh, I don't like to say, well, I, I just start with faith, believing in God, and from there I go on. I, I, I admire people who do that. I admire their faith. I, I'm more comfortable with looking at data like we did today and uh, saying, hey, no, looks to me like the data in favor of design is uh, stronger than the favor, data in favor of no design. And I can go back a little further. Uh, they say, well, you believe in God, and so the next question is, yeah, well, where did your God come from? And, uh, but there I also, I find a neutrality in that, where did anything come from? Uh, you're stuck there, uh, but the uh, the biochemical data and so on, and the uh, evidence for uh, design like we saw today, uh, so strong that you know I 
I'm more comfortable saying, hey, no, I, I look at the science. Uh, it looks, the scale is uh, on the side of some kind of design. I think that that's a really important point, um, is that you can actually approach this without having to assume your conclusions in the first place. It's one of the things that I feel badly about when Bill Nye and Ken Ham had their debate, that Ken Ham took a, uh, an approach that said that uh, the Bible is our final authority. And basically at that point, I think lost, uh, lost any ability for science to actually help him in his, in his quest. I think a more proper procedure is to do what I think is fair, which is distinguish the current scientific consensus from the, from the, uh, the actual facts of science. And I think that the actual facts of science, as opposed to the current scientific consensus, actually do argue for a designer. Once you've got the designer in, then you can't argue in the same way that nature is all there is and so we can only expect things that nature can produce. And then you have an entirely different job and that is to try to figure out what the creator had in mind. So um, I, I think that we are better off approaching things from a non-dogmatic uh, uh, point of view. Yes? Um, critique the author just a little bit. I'm not a chemist, and so whether he's correct in all of the things that he said about chemistry, he was able to make his point extremely clearly. I, I read the article and I thought, I can understand this. I get what this guy's point is. And I think that's a very important thing for a lot of science writers. They get lost in the details and they forget to make the point. And I thought he made the point very well. I can't disagree with you. His chapter is one of the reasons why we're looking at the book. Good choice. Um, to solve the conundrum that Dr. Roth was pointing out, um, I think we all sooner or later have to come face to face with the need for personal relationship to truth itself, regardless of where and how it, it comes to us. As the Bible itself says, the truth shall make you free. Well, that means that I need to be primarily interested in obtaining said truth somehow. The Bible is a vehicle to that, particularly the truth about the character of God and what he has done for us. But the work of God is also a source of a lot of insight into how things function. And even if we had all that information, it would not make us necessarily wiser unless we're willing to actually embrace it and love it. Never confuse a man who knows the truth with a man who loves the truth. That is a huge difference. We need to not only wish to know about something, we need to wish to own it, to possess it, to be it. That's the only way we can experience a transforming a power of it in our lives. OK, I'm going to let Wes uh, give us the last <laughs> word here. <laughs> Of course, that comes to mind. What comes to mind is a Kate's Ode to Beauty on a Grecian urn. Beauty is truth. Truth is beauty. 
now we really get into something vague. What is beauty? It's truth. In a way, Pilate had it right when he said simply, what is truth? We don't know what truth is. Postmodernism says there is none. But there is. It's, it really does come down to a matter of <clears throat> not of believing in God, and when you believe in God, you also believe in the Holy Spirit, who has been specifically commissioned to deal with us in such situations as this. It is the Holy Spirit that will give us the truth, and there is truth. It is interesting that so many people, all everybody in this room apparently, uh, can be accepted to accept the line of thought that was given today and in such a beautiful way. But then you take, it, take other people such as C.S. Lewis, who had certainly one of the biggest intellects of the last century. And he came to believe in God, not this direction at all, but through culture. And in turn, he warned against culture, saying that culture is the most pernicious of leaders to thought. So as we leave this room, we must, I think, appeal to the Holy Spirit to deal with us each in our own individual ways. Mm -hmm. All of us in this room have pretty similar ways but there are other people on this campus who are attending other sessions who have very different ways. And uh, unfortunately, we must say that those different ways have led them far astray, just as science can lead us far astray. Thank you very much. Well, next week we will uh, do another couple of chapters um, um, I think Steve Meyer is the difference it doesn't make and Jonathan Wells introducing us again to epigenetics and uh, so uh, barring my finding out that you can't compress those into one, one uh, session why we'll, that's where we'll go uh, see you next week